forward feedback with caring and integrity. I treated them exactly the way I treated my Marines to great success. That's how we build trust. That's how we build a team. That's how we build equity in what we're trying to accomplish. So I'll just, I'll just close here with, I did go a little bit faster, but I think I'm glad because I want time for questions. Um, you know, for the women, be confident and conf competent, be competent first and confident in who you are. And for the men, have the confidence to have some more frank conversations with women. Uh, have, have that courage to talk to them more freely and about what's going on inside your heads. So, so I hope you've all enjoyed that. I see there's questions. I am so looking forward to look, taking your questions. Uh, if you'd like to know more, uh, or if you're interested in talking more, please take a look at my website, which, which Hugo, one of your members, gratefully, so grateful to him, he helped me put it together. Okay. And I'll stop there for questions. Thank That's you so brilliant. much. Actually, there's, there's been more discussion running in the chat channel than we normally have. Um, uh, so I, if you want to look at run from the top, John Topot uh, has, has a question, which is what would you define as being the difference mm. between leadership and management? At which point without, no, can, we, can we have a short, the short version of this rather than the, rather than the argument that happens over, over, over several beers in the, in, the, in the bar? Oh, sure, absolutely. No, 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 I, I, I jest because it's an interesting, it's, it's a topic, of, it's, question, it's a really interesting question. Oh, it's a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question. Management to me is about just getting things done. You're worried about what happens at the end of the day. You're not, not that you're not uncaring about the people, but that's not the focus. The focus is, did the report get written? Did the statistics come in? Did I talk to this person? You, you're managing people and things. Leadership is about, is about the people and building the people, creating the vision, building the team, and then you don't have to focus so much on management because a lot of it, the stuff gets done. And it usually gets done a lot better, a lot more efficiently, and, and with a bit of innovation if you're open. So leadership focuses on the people and building the people. Management focuses on the things and getting the things done. Leadership will get the things done, but you're gonna have a team and a vision and something bigger than the sum of its parts. Great, that's really useful. Um, the next one, Dan, is Sarkamea's uh, question about, um, it just, she just, talk, it just talks about the, the phenomenon of psychological safety. Can you spot that one? I can. Your ob observations on, on that, or psychological safety? I admit I'm not familiar with the term psychological safety. I can guess oh. as to what its meaning is. Uh, oh, Sarka, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, yeah. let's just jump on. Uh, I mean, the whole thing that you described, it's actually psychological safety. And I'm a student and master's of occupational and psychology, um, uh, business psychology. So it's really uh, great that you described that. And my question was because I know um, in the outside world, it's not very usual that leaders think like this. So my question was uh, in your experience, how many leaders did you met outside of, of the military that would uh, approach or, or lead people really like careful and take the responsibility for the people and not for the tasks necessarily. Dive in quickly, Beth. It's what the USMC would call vulnerable leadership, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that I helps. appreciate that. The terms, it's all related. Uh, yeah. Just a little bit of a term. Uh, in the civilian world, unfortunately, not nearly enough. And it's it's, it's unfortunate because, you know, whether you call it uh, vulnerable leadership or psychological safety, it's actually very strong leadership. It takes a lot of strength to lead like that and to care about people and deal directly with people and, and do those sorts of things. So, but I will say too, it takes work. It takes effort. It absolutely does. Uh, leadership is not rocket science. The principles are not difficult. Nothing here that I've talked to you about is, is anything anyone couldn't do. But it does take effort. It takes time. 
And I feel like that's part of what might be holding up the business world. In the Marine Corps, the US Marine Corps, we lead from day one, from day zero even. That's what we're taught. It's, it's ingrained into us, it's built into us. So it's just how we act. It's literally, we just get so used to it. I don't even think about it anymore. It took me a while to figure out what my principles were. Cause I'm like, I just do this. Uh, but it takes some time to learn it and to implement it. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Cecilia, um, you, you're talking about vision. Do you, do you want to just, just bring that through? Absolutely. Yes. Hi, were you looking for me to ask the question? Yeah, I mean, if you want to, just you can <laughs> might want to expand and sort of you know, make a discussion, yeah. Yeah, no, I just thought it was really interesting. Thank you very much for a great talk. And it was more about, you talked about leadership and, and management. Um, and I think that's wonderful to hear your thoughts about that. But I also want to think about when you talk about your vision, how do you, do you have any tips about how you could instill in not just you as the leader, how would you communicate that? But how also would you make sure that I understand that as your employee potentially, and then would feel a sense of purpose and a sense a sense of something, a sense making in myself, it would be the word I would use, but a sense of purpose so that I also understand what you want to, to achieve. Um, what's the magic formula there that you, that you have? Um, maybe some key ingredients uh, to some, some of us so we can learn from that it would be great. Absolutely. So I think vision is, if not the most important, integrity is the most important thing, but vision is right behind it. Um, keep it simple. So when I think of vision, I don't think of mission statements. I don't think of complicated sentences with big words and things like that. Um, I keep it simple. I make it big. I make it aspirational in nature. And it's like, it's a realistic reach, like just beyond what we think we can accomplish. We're not quite sure we can do it, but we might be able to. So keep it really simple, short. And I'm gonna give an example. Uh, make it a realistic reach. And the bigness of it makes it possible for everybody to participate. And, and I can give, give two quick examples. When I was in Afghanistan, and I was a company commander in Afghanistan, we walked into, we were in charge of bringing all of the equipment back to the United States, of collecting all of the equipment that was used by the ground units and bringing it back to the United States. We were a unit that had never existed, that would not exist after the mission was done. We didn't know each other and we came into kind of a mess. There had been Marines there before, they had left it a disaster. It wasn't gonna be hard to improve upon them. And so my vision for the company became, we're going to leave this place better than, where we, than how we found it. That was it. We're gonna leave this place better than how we found it. And what's, what I loved about that vision is anybody could pick that up and run with it. My Marines who were working on shipping the equipment back to the United States could do what they, they could do whatever they, create what better meant for them and run. My supply Marines, my Marines doing motor transportation, anybody in that, that company could develop, what does it mean to me to leave this place better than how I found it? What does that mean to me? And that automatically supports the bigger vision because when everybody gets a little bit better, the whole thing gets better. And I can't tell you how proud I was to see that beautiful lot, empty of equipment, everything in its place, organization, processes that didn't exist before we were there. Like they invented something new that was entirely theirs, you know? And then the civilian example would be, you know, just to, to be the best, this type of, you know, firm that we can be period, uh, you know, international firm that we can be. And again, for the admin staff, that could mean one thing to do their job in a certain way. For the client support team, that could mean something else for, for different people. So keep it simple, no big words. You can if you really want, but to keep it, but to make it purposeful to everyone, just, you know, be the best this we can be in the world make this place better than how we found it. Take something that can have meaning, keep it simple and say it over and over and over again until you own it and they know you really believe in it. I said this all the time, whenever I walk the lot in Afghanistan, just leave it better than when you found it. What did it look like? What does it look like now? Okay, you're getting better. Okay, what else can we do? Over and over and over again. And I'll stop there, but is that helpful? 
Yes, thank you very much. That's really useful. Thank you. Great. Um, Paul had a question, if you can spot it, about intercultural differences. Do you spot any sort of, you know, particularly between oh. native partners, your experience of intercultural differences? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and it's it's so difficult because I think, you know, I walk into NATO and expect most people to to act the same. And that's not at all true. And I should not at all expect that. I will be hard pressed to talk specifically about different nations right here on the spot. But I will say, while I was working my NATO job, I learned to be receptive and to listen first to not talk quite so fast or take up quite so much time as Americans are wont to do. <laughs> I did learn that. And to ask more questions and offer less answers. Um, I generally found NATO partners, especially the Scandinavians, to be very thoughtful in their speech. Um, positive feedback given or in directness of speech. It's Paul here. What I was trying to get at Please. and explore in my own experiences of working transatlantic was the deeper you go into Scandinavia, there seems to be a greater directness compared to Southern Europe. I don't know whether other people have experienced that. Um, and within the more Anglo-Saxon community, uh, feedback tends to be perhaps more understated. Uh, even though there's a directness of speech, that doesn't necessarily carry across into when, when giving, uh, giving feedback to colleagues. Thank you, thank you, Paul, for speaking up. I was, I was, I was about to be a little frank and say the, the British are very circumspect with their, with their feedback. It always sounded like positive feedback, even though I know it wasn't. It sometimes took me three or five minutes to figure out that that wasn't a compliment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was very British. And the Scandinavians are very direct, but I was comfortable with that as a Marine and as an American. And I will admit the Italians specifically frustrated me a lot because they never seemed to say anything or commit to anything. <laughs> it, was, it was difficult. Yeah. I, I, I think John McNally's got an interesting question. It, in this, it's quite difficult in this current world. John, you, you can chip in, you know, to, to, to highlight those differences you're describing. You know, there's also, you know it, it's, it's a dangerous, sometimes we feel it quite dangerous to tread into that space. I mean, John, you know, where were you going with that? Was that sort of approach? I don't know whether it's so you may be you may be muted, John. John McAnally. Yep, got a bit of silence there. But I mean, it, so do you, do you want to pick that up? I mean, it, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it can be heresy in today's world. Uh, uh, oh, <laughs> you're you're here. <laughs> I, I unmuted myself. Shall I, shall I just go back to it there? But I think you grasped the question. Yeah, uh, really. The essence of your message seemed to be men and women are different beings. They think differently. And you've got to understand this and how each person, how men think, how women think. Is this not heresy in the modern age? It is. And I think to our detriment, you know, and I think the specific examples that I brought up are not examples that we talk about or that anyone really is brave enough to talk about, but, but to all of our detriment, because it hurts women who are trying to make their way in the business world and in the military world, quite frankly, and not understand how men are thinking, because they're not going to tell us. And I think it also challenges men not to understand women's perspective. I think it becomes heresy when we try to say, oh, this is all women, or this is all men, which is never true. There are many things that are much more natural to me that could be considered how a man thinks as a woman. Um, so I would take offense at, you know, the generalization, generalization of some things about a woman, you know, oh, she'll never ask for this, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's not me. So I think it's in the generalizations of, you know, if we say all men are all women, but not talking about it to me is to all of our detriment, men and women. So I was brave enough and I hope it was valuable. Can I, can I have a quick supplementary? Aren't you glad you left the Marine Corps before the trans debate? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know? 
the trans debate was less controversial than women in the infantry. I was shocked. Having been there for the full 18 months of women in the infantry discussion, the trans debate was a ripple in the pond. It just, I, I was really, really surprised. Cause yes, I was glad I was gone, but compared to women in the infantry, it just didn't even hit the radar. Hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, thanks. Um, Pam, 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 did you want to sort of ask your question? I mean, you can see it up there anyway. So, um, um yeah, it, it's just I, as I say, I I have a young male assistant, and I find that people very often address themselves to him rather than to me, even though I'm very obviously a lot older than he is. And people tend to assume that he's because he's the man, and he's a very young man. Um, he's in charge, and sometimes they even do it unconsciously. Yeah. You know, we we go to exhibitions a lot, and most of the dentists who come along will will address him. That's kind of to be expected. But for example, when we are traveling to an exhibition, we'll go into a hotel or we'll go to set up a conference and the hotel manager will address himself to my male assistant and ask him for instructions, even though, and I don't think, I wondered if that was an issue also in the Marine Corps where it is still quite predominantly male. Do you find it's very difficult to be recognized as the leader of men? Well, we've got an advantage in the military because we wear rank on our shoulders okay. or our collars. So it says when you walk up to a person, it's really not fair. When you walk up to a person, you know exactly where they stand in the hierarchy. Um, and as an officer, I, it was very obvious that I was in charge, especially at my younger ranks, because, you know, it was only I was the only officer and it was all enlisted. So I was in charge. Um, to your question about would you please do X, which men see as requests, not instructions. That's an interesting conversation. Um, I mean, I do say that I've not had it interpreted as a request in the Marine Corps or outside of the Marine Corps, but maybe that's just because I was obviously in charge because I was senior. Um, men do have a tendency in the Marine Corps to just give directions. Sometimes they ask though too. So I have not seen that as much as a gendered issue. Cause I have plenty of men who will ask, male leaders who will ask me if I can do things. And I take that as a direction, not as a request. They're just being polite. It, it does seem to me having worked with some US Marines a long, long time ago, 35, 40 years ago, it does seem to me that the the Marine Corps has softened his attitudes quite a lot. It used to be back in the 80s, it was very much a question of you took a recruit, you broke him down completely because they were mostly hymns then. Um, you broke him down completely, stripped his personality and then built him up as a Marine. Um, and, and that was sort of how it was explained to me rightly or wrongly. And, and also I worked with a Marine Corps Colonel and I had to explain to him that when dealing with civilian staff, it was polite to say please and a thank you, um, you know, generally speaking, because he, he didn't grasp that, that, that concept at all. It took me, it took me two years to explain to him, you know. Um, well, so it just seemed to have been, you, you, you know, you talked about caring and all those kind of things and Frankly, in the 80s, I didn't see an awful lot of caring in the Marine Corps. Well, so we showed it, we show caring in different ways. We don't, we still don't say please and thank you a whole lot, but that's oh, different lovely. than asking. Yeah, so we'll ask, can you do this? And we'll say it, we might say it gruffly. Um, and we don't usually say please or thank you, that's fair. And sometimes, a lot of times actually, I think civilians don't see the caring that Marines have for each other because it's, so straightforward, it appears gruff and harsh. Uh, and that's Marine, that's, that is strictly Marine Corps culture, which does not translate well to the civilian world. I have had to soften myself. I do watch my expletives nowadays, that took some training. Um, but the Marine Corps definitely has softened and has learned how to be more professional. And whether that's a reflection of society or I will say possibly the integration of more women 
Because one of the things that the military, all of the services have found as women are integrated into previously all male specialties and units, it professionalizes that area because suddenly men are not allowed to do a lot of the things that men could do when it's just, you know, all the guys around and they have to be a little bit more professional. It doesn't make us less effective. It actually makes us more effective, I would argue. Uh, but it, it does, it has changed the Marine Corps a little bit and whether that's society or the integration of more women or both, that is a change that's happened. Thank you. That's, that slides quite neatly into Martin's question about looking for those characteristics, the right blend. Martin, did you just want to sort of, know, sort of amplify that? Yeah, it was quite straightforward. I mean, I was very interested the way you were picking up male gender characteristics, female gender characteristics, and the advantages of being able to use both and, and to code switch between them. So does the Marine Corps, which may not necessarily be the same as Beth, does the Marine Corps actively look for female, female gender characteristics and male gender characteristics maybe when it's recruiting but certainly when it's selecting at later dates absolutely not so <laughs> but but i think you would do i think i'm saying yeah so no the marine corps absolutely does not the marine corps still believes uh that you know we're going to make you what we want you to be we're going to build you up whether whether we fully tear you down or partially tear you down we are going to reshape you in our own image and that is the marine identity which is higher than either masculine or feminine identities to the Marine Corps. Thank you. I'll buy that. I like that. <laughs> I certainly remember going through Dartmouth being broken down and rebuilt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and look what we got. <laughs> um, Al, you got a question from Al Wilson, um, which is a really interesting one. It's a, Al, did you want to sort of uh, expand on that? Yeah, thank you. Hi, good evening, and thanks for a really insightful uh, chat. Um, I um, 27 years in the Royal Navy as a warfare officer, and I was the a head of department, a young head of department, lieutenant commander on a ship in the Gulf just after the Second Gulf War, and we had a toxic leader in command, and the Navy turned a Nelsonian eye to it for a long time because in a training environment he got the job done, was effective, was robust and was admired. Um, when he got to a um, operational environment, he was unsafe. And it took almost mutinous, what you could be, perceive as mutinous behavior for us senior officers on the ship to highlight it to the hierarchy and be listened. It took a long time and there were casualties uh, along the way. Um, he was eventually sacked from command. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested to translate that toxic leadership into um, the civilian life where, you know, the bottom line is the ultimate output and, and perhaps um, people that will accept toxic leaders to get the job done and uh, get the income. I'd welcome your thoughts. Yeah, and, and they will. Um, just similar to the military, uh, they absolutely will accept toxic leadership, especially if this is not an eloquent analogy, but it certainly fits. It's, it's monkeys on a pole. And the monkeys looking down just see the smiling monkeys' faces. So if the bosses of the toxic leader are looking down at the results and just seeing all the good things happening, but they're not seeing what's happening to the people underneath that boss, they, they may not even be aware. And in the civilian world, it is even more challenging, I would argue, to take a stand against a toxic leader because you could get fired and lose your job. In the military, bad things can happen, but losing your income immediately is not one of them. Lots of different things can happen where you might eventually not be able to stay in the military, but you would not immediately lose your income by getting fired. Uh, so toxic leadership is definitely pervasive in the civilian world. It takes all, that's why I am such an advocate of learning how to lead up because it takes all of the tools in my toolbox to, for me to lead up for me to try to manage a toxic leader because a toxic leader needs to be led, needs to be managed because otherwise they're going to, as you've seen, they will destroy the organization just as surely in a business world as they will in a military world. Eventually people will leave. I'm sure we've all heard of this. People don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. I have, 
I left, a, I left a toxic boss. You know, I did everything that I possibly could with my civilian leader who had never been in the military, who micromanaged me into the ground after I had been proven. I had, you know, been in the military and been in the civilian world for upwards of 12 years at that point. And I did everything I could. And I finally just had to leave. Um, and that individual was never fired or placed aside because he produced results. He eventually just retired. And that's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. But toxic leadership is even more real on the civilian side than the military side. We actually have more tools in the military to do it, to deal with it. Leading up can help a lot. At the end of the day, it may just be a values-based decision. And you may have to decide whether you can leave and then if you leave or if you decide to stay. And as an executive coach, have you ever dealt with um, toxic leadership on a, on a board and been able to turn that toxic leadership into positive leadership? Turning toxic leadership? No, I have not dealt with that. I'm currently dealing with that in one particular instance with one company that I'm working with. Toxic leaders don't change, or I have not seen it. I haven't seen toxic leadership change. I won't say that it never happens. I'll see, I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I will say what I see most often is damage control, leading up, trying to you know put good people around that person. I have not seen toxic leadership change through coaching. A toxic leader is not aware that they're not a good leader. They think they're a great leader. That's what I've seen. They think they're great. They think they're doing all the right things. They have taken to heart the idea that it doesn't matter if people don't like you as long as they respect you. Now, on the positive side of leadership training, that's really important to know because it's not, it's not our jobs to make people like us. It's not. It's for them to respect us and to accomplish the mission. So we can't be afraid of that. But toxic leaders take that notion and they stick to it even in the face of others telling them that they're not successful, even being removed from their offices. So I haven't, I haven't experienced toxic leadership changing. I mean, there's a whole branch of executive coaching, which is called coaching alphas, you know, and, and alphas are, a, there are a particular challenge, but there is also a distinction in coaching between an alpha and a psychopath, you know, and, yes. you know, and, you know, that, that is the problem, you know, an, an, an alpha, you can generate some degree of insight, yes. but that is based upon their pride, their pride in themselves rather than yeah. anything else. Whereas, whereas a psychopath, you know, that, that's, a, that's a different business. Right. So I have led up and I have successfully taught other people how to lead up alphas, very strong, strong, masculine, uh, usually, not always personalities and been very successful at that. And that all goes back to understanding their priorities and their pressures um, and you know, what's pushing on them and then just give them what they want, just give them what they want. And then you're more likely to have autonomy to build trust and to get more wiggle room. Cause if you're dealing with a strong alpha personality, what you really want is more authority to operate within that and to get that person out of your business. If you're a middle level leader in that organization, um, or if you're just working directly for them. So thanks, Mark. That's a good distinction between just an alpha personality and a truly toxic leader. <laughs> truly toxic leaders, unfortunately, are not going to change their mind about themselves. Um, but strong personalities can be led. I've done that. I've coached that. And that's, that's I think, where the most benefit is. Okay. Because there's so many alphas out there who become leaders and, and they need help. And they don't know they need help. Um, I'm going to take a couple more questions and then we're going to sort of break people off into breakout rooms where they can chat and anybody who wants to continue the conversation with Beth for another 10 or 15 minutes can stay in the main room. There's an interesting question from John Pollard, um, which is attitudes based on ethnic backgrounds. John, did you just want to expand on that? Yes, I, I listened with interest when you said you were at NATO and you dealt differently with the Italians and the Scandinavians. I have the reverse thing. I went to America in 1980 as an anesthesiologist and uh, I was to specialize in heart surgery and the surgeons lined up, all American surgeons lined up and I was introduced to them. The first one was, and I'll put on an accent so you understand what I'm meaning. The first one was Joe Cook, 
who was, hello, how nice to see you, but in a Carolina accent. The second one was Harry Doherty, who was as Irish as the maid. The next one was Philip Hess, who virtually clicked his heels and shook hands with me. And I realized from that point on that I had to look at the person's surname to get an idea of how they would react under fire. By under fire, I mean if something went wrong. Did you ever find the same? Or have Americans lost this because you all think you're in a melting pot and you're not? <laughs> You know, I had not seen that inside the Marine Corps. Um, well, the Marine Corps especially, <laughs> I mean, right. outside life. Um, so I'm originally from New York and New York definitely still has, you're a New Yorker and people know you're a New Yorker by the way that you act and the way that you talk and even the way you cross the street. I have not been in New York in many, many decades, so I've lost all of that. But, you know, there's, there is still that sense around the country that, you know, if you're from the South or if you're from New York or if you're from out West or, or different places that you might act a certain way, but it's very Americanized at this point. It's no longer internationally, um, I think in the way that you're describing. Uh, not, not from my sense anyway. Okay. Not so sure, but never mind. <laughs> You've been on the this evening. Okay. And I get to the final question, and I said people can stay on and chat to Beth in the main room, but Bill's got an interesting... Bill, did you want to pick up that bit about being outside the comfort zone? Oh, yeah, yes, certainly. Um, hello. Thank you very much for the speak, uh, talk. Oh, can I just ask you a quick comment on, on the, the last point? I certainly well, think the military is a real melting pot. It takes people from all over the country or further, and you all sort of... You sort of end up coming to an average, I think, a, a mean, so that you all understand each other, I think, yeah. to an extent. But um, no, I, um, I, was, I spent a, a few weeks with the US Marine Corps in one of their camps, and um, I was surprised it was very different. The, the, the British ones tended to try and uh, make the best of it and try and add a few creature comforts and make them a bit more homely, whereas the, uh, the Marine one was, I mean, it was desert roses and ration packs, and it was very austere, deliberately. And um, I was told that was the Colonel's policy. I was wondering, if, is that a, a US Marine mindset to so that people don't get comfortable in the comfort zone and are willing to go out beyond the wire. And yeah. have you used that in Civil Street, you know, to keep people, uh, you know, not to let people become comfortable? That's definitely a Marine Corps thing. I, when I was in Afghanistan, I was at Camp Leatherneck and we would go over to the British side to eat in your chow halls because you had better food. <laughs> <laughs> it was just fact. <laughs> um, we used to do the other way around. <laughs> Did. Um, but yeah, the British and anybody outside of the United States camp side of the camp was was much more comfortable. And the Marines are more austere than the Army or the Navy. And we do that purposefully. We don't want Marines to get too comfortable. And because, you know, not more, not just because we don't want them to not want to go outside the wire, but you get too comfortable. And from a Marine Corps perspective, you lose awareness, you lose some sharpness. There is, there is something positive to uh, Spartan surroundings, to a stoic perspective on life that the Marine Corps, as I'm sure you know, really embraces. And there is a lot of strength that we find in that. Have I applied that to civilian world? No, absolutely not, because that would not go over well in people who did not join up for that. You know, when you enter the Marine Corps, we're famous for saying we didn't promise you a rose garden. It's going to be really hard. We don't think you can make it. So, you know, and, and we make it a good thing that you've survived, that you've suffered, you've gotten through this. But in the civilian world, you know, people, they're there for a job. They're not there for harshness. They're not there for toughness. And so that part of the Marine Corps, I have not brought to the civilian life. I don't think it would go over. No, I, I think there's a room for stoicism in, in general life, though, in a, a certain level. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Personally, I agree with you. I'm going to draw this stage to an end and open up some breakout rooms, but I'd like to say thank you very much indeed, Beth. That was really interesting. The level of discussion that's been going on and chat that's going on in it and the questions have been really interesting. The only thing I bet about being stoic, I always remember in Germany, we, as long, if we were downwind of an armoured battalion, we always knew they were there because we could smell the fresh coffee. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so, so they were they were they were they were, they were probably not as but Beth that was really truly splendid thank you very much indeed really engaging really interesting you know it 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 made people think and that's absolutely splendid um, I